Hey everyone, how you doing? Uh, lecture 7.6. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the idea here, uh, this is going to be a, a quick little lecture, um, but we're at this transition point between classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Um, and I, I know that it's important at this point to, to make a point or two to you to help you really think about the difference between those two. So that's the main thing I want to do with this lecture, but I also want to give you a sense of why this matters and why it was so important and why it continues to be so important. So specifically, let's lecture 7.6, learning as personal evolution. This is really, you know, I, I, I've already talked about how this whole behaviorism um, school fits within the history of science uh, in a sense, and that it is to some extent a response against evolution theory. Um, and, and what I mean by that is evolution theory put a lot of emphasis on uh, genetics and, and biology. And I've told you that behaviorism is sort of a reaction to that and saying, no, no, it's not all about genetics and biology. It's also about how the environment shapes us. And so in one way, it's sort of a counterpoint to some of that evolutionary idea. But in another way, it encompasses it as well. Because sort of the notion is... Well, let's, let's walk through it. Let me jump through it a little bit. Um, if we think of evolution, evolution theory, and if you ask yourself, what is the core question that evolution theory is intended to answer? It's really this. How did life, all the forms of life, become so complex? You know, especially if we started, as science believes, from as, as very simple organisms, that life began as very simple organisms, and then somehow it became everything we see. Uh, today. And I'm just showing you sort of animal biodiversity here, uh, but we could think of plant biodiversity as well, right? Life takes so many different shapes. It's so complex. How did so much complexity, so much variety, so much biodiversity result from a, a initial very simple organism? What are the processes, the process or processes that produced such variety of life? And evolution is an attempt to answer that, you know, through natural selection and through the, the continuation of traits that were uh, evolutionarily valuable, um, Darwin provided a framework to explain exactly that, um, how life became as variable as it is. Okay, so now let's imagine instead of thinking of life in the universe, we're thinking of behaviors emitted by you. Okay, so this is where we kind of make the transition to learning and, and what you're learning in this chapter. When we start our life, our behavioral repertoire, those behaviors we emit, um, is small and relatively simple. The mappings are pretty simple. What can we do as an infant? Uh, we can wriggle around, we can cry, we can suck on things. We, you know, we can't even grab things yet as an infant. Our hands are pretty useless to us. We can pee, we can poop. Um, that's about what we can do um, as an infant. But of course, now, if I look at you and I looked at all the behaviors that you emitted throughout a given day, wow, that behavioral repertoire has grown. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can do, both, both you know, behaviorally with your body, um, but also within your mind, you know, mental math and all sorts of stuff that you couldn't do as an infant. How did you evolve this complex set? of behaviors, and not just the set of behaviors, but the context in which you emit those sort of behaviors, the connection between the world and the behaviors. This is really what learning is all about. It's, it's, it's really trying to think about, okay, how did we go from that infant that could really just cry when it was unhappy in some way? You know, that was the sort of one manipulative thing we had. How did we go from that to being an adult with this rich and varied set of behaviors? Um, so it is like evolution theory in that sense, except it's personal evolution. How does this person evolve through the life and how does it learn all of these new behaviors and when to emit them? That's really what behaviorism is all about. Um, understanding that, that personal development process, that behavioral development process within human beings.
Um, and so within that framework, when you kind of think of it like that, then if we go back to classical conditioning, you think, okay, this is what this is why classical conditioning was so important when Pavlov originally uncovered it. Um, he is basically saying, hey, you know what? We're born with certain innate behaviors and responses. And so, you know, I guess that you could say I probably didn't do the infant justice in the previous slide because we have other behaviors. Um, you know, things like if, if you did pro do something like this to an infant, I don't know why you would scare an infant and do something in his face, but he would probably show that sort of startle response and stuff like that. So there are all of these innate behaviors that we're born with. And what Pavlov was showing is there is this process, classical conditioning, where we can create new stimulus response associations. So what are we talking about here? You know, the fact that the dog can learn to drool to a bell. That's a new stimulus response association. It did not initially drool to the bell, but if the bell predicts food, if there's an association between that stimulus and some one of these innate ones, like food that produces drooling and such, then we can learn to add that behavior to that stimulus. We can start drooling to the bell, okay? And this is now a new stimulus response association, almost like a new form of life, you know, a new behavior um, and, and added to this dog's repertoire of behaviors. They now drool to bells. Um, I don't know if that's a very effective or useful one, um, but the notion is he's showing a process where these new responses um, and, and new stimulus response associations can be created. And so that's the beginning of saying, okay, this is how a very simple response, drooling to food, can now give way to more complexity of behavior. Okay, now I have underlined here via association, you know, the core driving point for classical conditioning is some new stimulus predicts something that we already have a behavior towards. And it's that prediction, it's that f the association that the bell occurs reliably before the food. That's what sort of supports the learning, right? Um, now we're going to move now to something called operant conditioning and we'll originally associate it with John B. Watson. But there'll be other characters. Skinner will be very um, prominent among them. And they're going to talk about a different answer to this question, operant conditioning, a different answer to the question of how did our behavioral repertoire become so complex? How does that happen through our lives? And you're going to see it's, it's still about the same thing. It's still about forming new stimulus response associations. So increasing the complexity of our behaviors. But the process will be different. In the case of operant conditioning, it won't be about associations, it'll be about consequences. That is, you know, just to give you the general sense, the idea will be that you might find yourself in some situation and you might not know how to behave in that situation. And so you might originally behave in a sort of random way or, you know, slightly informed way. You'll do what you think might be the right thing to do and then stuff is going to happen after you behave. And it'll either be good things or it'll be bad things. And if good things happen when you behave a certain way in a certain situation, now you're going to be more likely to behave that way again. So we're going to strengthen the association between that situation and that response. If bad things happen, then you're less likely to behave that way in the future um, in that situation. And so it's really going to focus on the consequences of behavior and how those consequences now shape your likelihood of behaving that way or not in the future. But at its core, it's got that same quality. It's going to describe how our behavioral repertoire increases, how we learn you know, new sets of behaviors, how we associate them with new situations, how we go from that very simple infant to that very complex adult, um, and what the processes are along the way. Uh, and so, you know, obviously that's a critical uh, issue for psychology um, and it really does sort of complement some of the biological or genetic sort of um, aspects where we know some of our behaviors are genetically at least informed, if not determined, you know, your parents qualities psychologically, you've inherited some of that and that's going to be part of who you are. But so too are your experiences with the world. 
And these theories describe how your experiences with the world contribute to making you the complex individual you are. Um, and that's why this is all important. Okay, so we're going to move from classical to operant now. And I've got these two things underlined via association versus by consequences. Um, I'm going to probably highlight it at the end of the chapter as well so that you can try to kind of keep these two forms of learning, you know, realize what they have in common. They're both describing how human behavior becomes more complex, but also realize what they have um, different, which is the process by which that complexity occurs. It either is occurring as a function of associations and predictive values of certain stimuli in classical conditioning, or it's because of the consequences of the behavior, and that's operant conditioning. Okay, so with that clear, jump into the operant conditioning chapter. I will see you there. Okay, bye-bye.